Good morning. I'm Caroline Fredrickson. I'm the president of the American Constitution Society, and I'd like to welcome you to our annual Supreme Court review. Um, we are, I think, as all of you know, and to our viewers on C-SPAN, we're the nation's leading progressive legal organization with over 200 student and lawyer chapters in almost every state and at almost every single law school. We were originally formed as the progressive response after the Bush v. Gore decision, uh, and ACS was founded on the principle that law should be a force to improve the lives of all people. Now, the Supreme Court term that ended... I know, it shouldn't, we shouldn't actually have to say that that's an aspiration, um, <laughs> but unfortunately it is. Um, and, and that brings us to the Supreme Court term that ended uh, yesterday uh, and left us with quite a number of unanswered questions and some that were answered in ways that we might not have liked, um, but that all lead us to the conclusion that courts really matter. And whether you care about the environment immigrants' rights, an accurate census, or fair and nonpartisan districts where the voters choose their elected officials instead of the elected officials choosing their voters. You should care about who sits on the bench. Recently, ACS was very pleased to publish an issue brief by Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island, which starkly demonstrates how, quote, part Polarized along partisan lines, the Supreme Court has become. Senator Whitehouse's conclusion is that, quote, Republican appointees have, with remarkable consistency, delivered rulings that advantage big corporate and special interests that are the political lifeblood of the Republican Party. And he includes a detailed appendix to back up his thesis. If you have not read this very important issue brief. Please pick up a copy outside, or you can find it on our website. So how did the court fare this term with respect to its votes? And what has the addition of Justice Brett Kavanaugh meant for the court? To, be, to begin to answer these questions and more, it is my great pleasure to introduce our repeat moderator, we love him so much, we have, try and have him back at every possible opportunity. You all know who I'm talking about, Tom Goldstein. <laughs> Tom, as you know, is one of our nation's most experienced Supreme Court practitioners. He's a, part, a partner at Goldstein and Russell, co-founder and publisher of the invaluable resource, SCOTUS Blog, where we are all which we were all glued to yesterday, yesterday morning. Uh, and Tom has served as counsel to a party in well over 100 merits cases at the Supreme Court and will argue his 43rd this fall. He's taught Supreme Court litigation at Harvard and at Stanford Law Schools. In 2010, the National Law Journal named him one of the nation's most influential, influential lawyers of the decade, and Legal Times named him, wow, listen to this, one of the 90 greatest Washington lawyers of the last 30 years. So we could not be in better hands uh, than, to be, uh, than to have Tom Goldstein as our moderator. So please join me in welcoming Tom. Thank you all for taking the time to come to ACS's annual wake for the Supreme Court term. <laughs> Uh, we really actually do appreciate uh, both everyone who's here in the room and everybody who has uh, been kind enough to watch on C-SPAN. Uh, it is obviously an incredibly important transitional time at the Supreme Court. As was just mentioned, we have uh, Brett Kavanaugh and his first term. We have uh, Justice Gorsuch uh, beginning to settle in at the Supreme Court. And we have, because of the departure of Justice Kennedy, who we miss terribly, um, uh, we begin to see the hardening, perhaps, of an even more conservative Supreme Court majority, and we start to look forward uh, into the future about what that will mean. Uh, it has been a really interesting term, Justice Kavanaugh, uh, really kind of settling in without uh, breaking a lot of new ground. He was the justice in the majority most this term, more than 90% of the time, and the two justices who agreed the most together were the Chief Justice and Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, and we start to see whether or not they'll form a kind of center-right or conservative coalition 
uh, with justices even further to the right, in Justices Alito and Thomas and Gorsuch. But there's a lot to, to learn about. In addition, one of the wonderful things about doing this on the last day of the last week of the term is we're doing things a bit in real time. And so the Supreme Court has just issued orders uh, in the past few minutes, uh, granting the last cases before the justices leave for very important chamber music festivals in Salzburg. Um, <laughs> and uh, they have agreed to hear the DACA cases. And so the court is going to take up several decisions in validating the administration's invalidation of DACA, which is obviously a very significant issue. And in addition, among other cases, they have taken not only Bridgegate uh, uh, from the Christie administration in New Jersey, but also um, a very, very, very significant case on religion uh, and uh, governmental aid that could be used in parochial schools. And that, I think, is one of the uh, untapped areas uh, where the court has significant uh, areas that uh, significant room to maneuver to the right and change a lot of law. Uh, we are really, really lucky to have people uh, travel from all over the country to come and talk with us about the cases from the term who are experts in their individual fields. I will not take up the whole time doing introductions you have uh, in materials that have been provided to you in the room. Uh, details of all of their professional qualifications, but we, it is really incredible the level of specialty that we have with respect to um, the lines of cases of the term that are most significant and the individual cases that are uh, most important that will have the longest lasting effect. It will, I think, go down as an incredibly important term. The, there, it includes the pair of decisions that I think are most significant in the entire time that I've practiced in the Supreme Court. That includes Bush versus Gore, much more important than that in the partisan gerrymandering cases, and, and I think it'll have an enormous effect on the way the, our nation is governed. Uh, I wanna start with uh, Dan Takaji and of Ohio State, uh, who's gonna talk to us about the incredibly important census case and tell us uh, whether it's gonna be on the form. Well, so the answer, Tom, to that question is we still don't know, and I think that a lot of the celebration that's been occurring on this case uh, as a result of yesterday's ruling that for now the question can't be on the form is premature. We don't know for sure and we won't know for several months. But let me back up a little bit. Tom's asked us to describe these cases in our openings very briefly. I can describe this case so briefly, in fact, in just two words. They lied. <laughs> they lied brazenly, bald-facedly, in a way that everybody on the court, indeed, I'm sure everybody in the room understood, uh, and by they, I mean the Department of Commerce, Wilbur Ross in particular, about the reasons for adding the question uh, on citizenship to be asked on the census form with respect to everybody who's taking the census. Um, so what was the reason that they actually gave? Well, the reason that they gave was we need to ask this question about citizenship in order to enforce the Voting Rights Act and particularly to make sure that the voting rights of Latinos are protected. I, I want to ask you, to how many people think that's a plausible explanation for the <laughs> Trump administration? Yeah, OK. Ratio, OK. So I, I, I'm glad not to see any hands on that one. It wasn't. And I think at the time this case was argued, based on the record that was before the district courts out of Maryland, California, and New York, based on the record that was going up to the Supreme Court, everybody knew that wasn't really the reason for asking it. Well, what was the reason for asking it? The suspicion, and I think it's pretty clear now, is that the real reason for asking the question, or at least a big part of the reason, was to depress the number of people, especially uh, Latino households, that would respond to the census. If you ask that question, um, we're going to get a significant drop in how many people respond, somewhere in the neighborhood of 8%, most likely, among Latino house households nationwide. Well, why does that matter? It matters because the census determines how monies are allocated among the states and within the states, 
and most important to my area of law, election law, it matters because it determines political representation. The census under the Constitution determines how many representatives each of the states gets in Congress. It also is used to determine how districts are drawn within the state. And as you know, unless you've been under a rock for the past several weeks, um, there's been some information that has come to light uh, as the result of some unusual circumstances. The death of Mr. Richard Hoffeller uh, and the discovery in his hard drives by his estranged daughter of a lot of information, which pretty clearly shows what the motivation, at least the main motivation, was. Um, there was a desire on the part of Mr. Hoffeller, who's been dubbed the Michelangelo of gerrymandering, and others to draw districts and, and to divide states up into districts, not based on total population, as every state in the country now does, but instead based on the citizen population, which would significantly underrepresent minority communities. So they lied. Not only is the rationale that the Trump administration, uh, Wilbur Ross in particular, gave untrue, it is the opposite of the truth. The real motivation for adding the census, uh, the citizenship question to the census was to suppress representation by, as Hoffeller put it in one of his emails, uh, um, uh, Hispanics uh, and to course, correspondingly advantage Republicans and non-Hispanic whites. Um, I thought this case was probably going to go the other way based on the oral argument. I think most observers did. If you read <laughs> Chief Justice Roberts' opinion uh, for different majorities, part of it is for the right side of the court, part of it is with the left side. Um, it's really kind of schizophrenic. It looks like he's going in the direction for most of the opinion, if you didn't read the syllabus or headline, of upholding the census question. Then at the very end of the opinion, part five, he switches directions and concludes, joined by the four less conservative justices on the court, that the department's reasons for adding this question were pretextual. He doesn't use the word lie, but that's basically what the court concludes in that part of the opinion. What I think happened here, and this is speculation on my part, is that it just became so transparently obvious that the administration's explanation for the census question was not just untrue, not just a lie, but the opposite of the truth that the court, by which I really mean Chief Justice Roberts couldn't look the other way. But the Department of Commerce is going to get another chance. And we don't know how this is going to come out yet. The, pre the president has already indicated that they're going to, no surprise, uh, try again, which the court's opinion allows them to do, to come up with a rationale for adding the question to the census. Um, and I, I suspect only Chief Justice Roberts, maybe his clerks, but maybe not even that, know for sure exactly what's going to happen and whether, to answer your question, Tom, the, the citizenship question will in fact appear on the 2020 census. So, so what happens now? So like after yesterday, yeah. where are we yeah. uh, with the different cases, with the, with the administration? What might it say? Yeah. So uh, the cases have been, um, have, have been sent back down. Um, and you probably have a better answer to this than I as a much closer Supreme Court watcher. But th they're going back to the lower courts, not only the New York District Court from which this case that was decided yesterday came, um, um, but also in Maryland, where the Fourth Circuit a few days ago voted to reopen proceedings on whether the ad addition of this question was intentionally racially discriminatory. Um, the Department of Commerce will get to try again, and they will. Um, the uh, plaintiffs in the cases challenging the citizenship question will seek an injunction from one or more of the lower courts. And I strongly suspect that uh, one or more of those lower courts will again 
enjoin the question, at which case it will be back up before the Supreme Court. I I'm pretty confident, based on my reading of the opinions from yesterday, about how eight of the nine justices on the court are going to vote, right? I'm pretty confident that Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan are going to vote to uphold any injunction against the question, and that Justices Thomas, Alito, uh, Kavanaugh, and Gorsuch will vote to stay or overturn any such injunction, but I don't know what the chief is going to do. Uh, I, in, in my view, I, I think the court would lose a great deal of institutional credibility if it gave its imprimatur to the addition of this question after it's been so clear that the Trump administration lied. And as we all know, this is hardly the first time. It's practically like breathing uh, for some people in this administration to lie. Uh, but I don't know whether the chief will feel the same way. Jane? Um, so uh, what did you think about the um, you know, concurring conservative yeah. and then dissenting justice's opinion? One of the things that really struck me was, first of all, the extent to which they were calling the lower courts political. Um, I mean, came out and, and said that this was a decision for this administration only, and sort of went on a real diatribe against the, the Southern District Court on, on sort of political grounds. That was, I think, quite remarkable in an opinion. I don't, I don't know that I've ever seen that kind of an attack on a lower court judge in the Supreme Court opinion. Um, the other thing that's really striking, and we'll see this when I talk about the administrative law cases later, is you know, you've got the conservative justices who have been really pushing back on administrative power, and here they're welcoming it with open arms um, uh, on the part of Secretary Ross. Um, and so there's, if you look at the cases across the span, um, there's a real interesting contrast and disconnect for where they're willing to embrace administrative power and where they think, no, it's, it, it's got to be held back. Jason. Well, I think you want to address the, the administration's process for getting where they got. But I do want to talk a little bit about the citizenship question and, and citizen voting age population data when you're doing Voting Rights Act cases. So right now, every one of these cases, so in 2000 was the last time the census question was on the short, or was on the long form census, which went to about one in every six households. Since then, um, it, during the Bush administration, uh, the citizenship question was moved to a, something called the American Community Survey, which goes to about 2% of the country every year. And in the Obama administration, the Obama Justice Department in 2011 or 2012 asked the Census Bureau to do what they called a special compilation of ACS data to try to give some better citizenship estimates than just sort of statewide estimates that you could derive from, from the ACS data. And the problem when you get into particularly Voting Rights Act enforcement in smaller jurisdictions is the error rates in the census special tabulation from 2011 and 2012 are massive. Um, talking about census blocks where their citizenship estimates, the Census Bureau will tell you, and I think I forget what percentage of the blocks, but a good percentage, 10, 20, 30 percent of the blocks, had error rates that were in excess of 70 percent, which means the Census Bureau basically says our block level estimates aren't functional. And that's a problem when you get down to Voting Rights Act enforcement in small jurisdictions. Um, there was a, a village in New York that had a, a Section 2 case brought during the Bush administration. And part of the problem was when they went to try to draw districts, they really didn't have granular enough data to know where the Hispanic residents of the community were in order to draw the districts. Why? Because they were trying to draw based on ACS data that they knew when you brought it down to the level of a small village you literally didn't have the data to know where the Hispanic voters were and where the Hispanic voters weren't. And so I do think that the, the, the granularity of the data that you can get from the, from the Census Bureau without the citizenship question when you're trying to do Voting Rights Act cases or defend Voting Rights Act cases or be a plaintiff in Voting Rights Act cases in small jurisdictions is really challenging right now because Census doesn't ask the question on the short or long form. Just a quick response on that. I mean, Jason's certainly right that in Voting Rights Act litigation, that's my main field, election law and voting rights, it is sometimes necessary to ascertain how many citizens live in a particular area. It's a different question whether that you need to ask that question or whether it will help to ask the citizenship question on the actual census as opposed to the American Community Survey in order to ascertain how many 
citizens of various races and ethnicities are actually living, living in an area. And what the evidence shows, you know, in this Trump world, facts do still matter in some places, including, let's hope, the courts. Uh, the facts show that asking the question will actually discourage participation and get you less accurate information. And voting rights experts submitted submitted testimony and, and affidavits in some of these cases, which actually showed that, in fact, you don't need to ask this question, and it won't help to ask this question in order to litigate voting rights cases. This is coming from people like Professor Pam Carlin, who is one of the leading Voting Rights Act experts in the country. So it's just not true that you need to ask this question to get reliable information to enforce the Voting Rights Act. That is false. And it is certainly false that this was the reason that the Trump administration decided to ask the question. Yeah, I, I will say that I think then in the end that your first take on the oral argument that the administration was going to win was going to win will end up being the, the ultimate take in a year on the case. Because well, we jump to part five of the opinion and we skip over yeah. the other parts in which yeah. all of the plaintiffs' other claims are rejected by the Supreme Court. Uh, and I think that that's where the yeah. actual legal rule when it comes to the census will apply. And then we have this don't lie principle. And if the administration turns around you know, over the weekend and writes a letter saying we, a we ask the question because we want to ask the question, that may be enough for the chief. Uh, but why don't we, Jillian, then turn to the administrative law questions and any overlap with the census. We have both an enormous non-delegation case and also a case where there seemed to be a lot of movement uh, towards overruling one of the court's big administrative or most uh, you know, significant and, and most often invoked uh, administrative law doctrines. Sure, yeah. I mean, so this was a, this was a big term for, for ad law. Ad law professors have been very happy in tweeting away nonstop. <laughs> um, uh, and I think that the overall theme, um, you know, what we've been seeing over the last five to ten years is a growing conservative attack on the administrative state. Um, and I think um, that uh, attack has clearly gained adherence, no big surprise, um, with the addition of Gorsuch and Kavanaugh to the court. But what's really interesting is it's still falling short. Um, uh, and the victories that the conservatives really expected to get this term did not come through. Um, the main protagonists in this battle have emerged as Justice Kagan for sort of settled rules of administrative law and Neil Gorsuch as the um, uh, protagonist who's going to bring the administrative state down. Um, but the person who really holds the power is the chief, um, uh, you know, very carefully uh, signing on to particular parts of opinions um, in one of the cases, Kaiser. So let me just uh, say a little bit about the non-delegation case, the Gundy case first. Um, uh, this was a, a, a challenge to a provision in the Sex Offender Registration Notification Act that basically let the attorney general determine how that act was going to apply to individuals who had been convicted of um, sex offended offenses prior to the act's adoption. Um, and the um, uh, delegation was attacked as an unconstitutional delegation, too broad a delegation of legislative power to the administrative branch. That's a, uh, you know, the non-delegation doctrine has been around for a long time. Um, the last time a non-delegation challenge ever succeeded was in 1935. Um, uh, two or three, depending on how you count them, cases were upheld then. Um, before that, all non-delegation challenges failed, right? So the interesting issue here is, first of all, that the court granted this challenge. There was no circuit split down below. Um, uh, and then, uh, in addition, that there was a very strong dissent um, holding, indeed, that um, uh, for the dissenters, that the delegation was unconstitutional. But again, they didn't win the day. Um, Justice Kagan wrote for a plurality, um, upholding the SORNA delegation as just you know, actually a pretty easy case under existing precedent. Um, she got there by reading the statute narrowly. This is standard fare. This is what the court has done for decades. Um, uh, and again, what's striking is really not the plurality. It's this dissent penned by Justice Gorsuch, um, joined by Thomas and joined by the chief, um, which I found particularly surprising. Um, who would have held that the delegation was unconstitutional, and in the process of doing so, didn't just focus on the fact that this was a criminal law provision, that it had retroactive aspects to it. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why you could not like SORNA. Um, but he didn't focus just on those. He basically took a very broad view about what kind of um, power uh, can be delegated and broadened that he wants to pull back um, broadly on the delegation of power. He thinks that Congress can delegate fact-finding power, 
Congress can delegate some filling in the details power, but what Congress can't do is delegate um, policy judgments with respect to the rules that are going to govern private conduct. And here's the thing. The administrative state is rife with exactly those delegations, right? Including the delegation in the census case, which everybody, <laughs> including the chief and the dissenters, made a point to say was a broad delegation and therefore why was the court sticking its nose in? Um, so one interesting feature is why were the conservative justices so untroubled by the delegation in the census case? and yet so troubled by the delegation in the, in the SORNA case, Gundy. Um, uh, but separate from that, um, what you really see is that Gorsuch's dissent, um, uh, it, it really sort of is this sort of very bold, strong attack against the administrative state, one that Thomas had previously signaled in an earlier 2015 concurrence that he wrote, but that was a solo, solo authored uh, concurrence. Now we're getting um, at least uh, three votes fully. Um, and in addition, Justice Alito um, uh, concurred in the judgment saying he was open to reconsidering the delegation doctrine, but unless the court was actually going to do that, he thought this case was easy. Kavanaugh was not on the court when it was, when it was argued, so we, it was an eight um, a justice panel. Um, we know there's in, when he was on the DC Circuit, he had some opinions where, uh, in, indicating that he was willing to pull back on administrative power at times using delegation. So it's possible there may be a majority for some pullback on delegation in the near future. Um, there can is ask, at least- Can I ask an inside yeah. baseball question about that? And so we have four members on the left saying, I'm not gonna apply the non-delegation doctrine, the statute's mm -hmm. fine. We have three more conservatives saying, I'm gonna apply the doctrine aggressively. Justice Alito saying, well, I don't have a five justice majority here, so I'll give Justice Kagan a fifth vote just to uphold the statute. Why is it that the case wasn't re-argued? So Brett Kavanaugh wasn't right. on, the right. on the court at the time, as you say. So effectively, there was a 4-4 tie. And usually in that situation, what you would do is you would just have the Ninth Justice uh, be a part of the court. But no one in the court suggests this. I can't figure out why it is that Justice Alito says, if I only had a Ninth Justice, uh, I would consider this question. Brett Kavanaugh's over there yeah. waving his yeah. arms, saying, <laughs> hey. Yeah. Yeah. And then, but the court just. I find it really puzzling. Um, I mean, so one line people have said is that, um, uh, Alito uh, concurred in the, in the uh, plurality in order to get the chief on record as dissenting. Um, uh, but that doesn't explain why you wouldn't grant for re-argument, right? That explains why you maybe don't want it to be e you know, affirmed by an equally divided court, right? So I don't know why they didn't um, uh, go for that. It could be, and I think this may be the case. I don't think Alito is so sympathetic to the delegation argument here, right? Um, uh, I think he may be more sympathetic to the delegation argument in some big regulatory statutes, but not necessarily in the case of. Uh, He's not going to race to the be the savior of sex offenders. Um, I don't think so. Um, uh, so I think that may be playing a role. Um, uh, and then he also wanted to get the chief on record two together. I'm actually not so sure you're going to see a majority for a major pullback of delegation doctrine. In part, just because that would be so profoundly disruptive, right? I mean, that would really call yeah. any number of major statutory regulatory regimes, the whole way our government operates, the whole way governments at the state and local level operate into question. Um, obviously, those are different delegation doctrines, but delegation is rife. It is the core of modern government. Um, although the chief joined the dissent, um, which again, I find really quite puzzling, um, I don't know that he's on board for that kind of disruption. I would be surprised. And again, you could say this was a kind of unique delegation because it was so criminal law focused. Um, that maybe it was one that would get more, um, more ire from some justices other than um, Alito. Um, we may see this coming soon. There is another delegation challenge and a cert petition pending before the court involving um, the uh, section 232 of the Trade Expansion Act of 1962, which delegates a lot of power to the um, president over um, uh, trade and tariffs having to do with national security. On the other hand, it's national security, and I think even the Gorsuch dissent signals that's an area where we may be allowed to have broader delegations. So it may not be that indicative, even if they grant. Um, okay, so that's Gundy. Um, on Kaiser, it's really a very similar setup. You have Kagan uh, writing the uh, opinion, sort of defending the standard administrative law review, uh, law position. The issue in the case was um, a, a doctrine of deference where courts defer to agencies' interpretations of their regulations. Um, uh, if the regulations, um, uh, if the interpretations uh, are not uh, plainly erroneous and are consistent with the, the regulation. Um, it's a doctrine that goes back uh, in time, for a long time. The uh, 
Uh, it's called either Our Deference or Seminole Rock. Seminole Rock is a 1945 uh, decision, I believe. You can even trace these cases back into the 19th century. Um, uh, and so it's a longstanding uh, doctrine of deference. Mm -hmm. um, conservatives have been, their big attack has been to challenge the idea that courts should defer to administrative agencies' interpretations of either statutes or regulations. So this was really a big fight that conservatives have been bringing ever since um, I think it was 2011, Justice Scalia signaled he thought that deference to agency interpretations of regulations was unconstitutional and problematic. Um, and you've had these cases coming and coming and coming. Um, they granted cert once on a case, ended up having to, to dig it because of an action by the Trump administration to moot the case. Um, and they finally had that challenge before them in Kaiser and really thought that this was going to be the end of this thing called our uh, deference. Instead, actually, the court refuses to overrule it. Um, in an opinion written by Kagan um, with the Chief Justice joining key parts of the opinion, in particular Kagan's defense of the existing doctrine on stare decisis grounds and her setting out the scope and limits of uh, the deference. Um, uh, and it's interesting, you know, some uh, people think that, that by setting out the scope and limits and in some ways narrowing the um, scope of this deference doctrine, many ways, by the way, following the line argued by the Solicitor General in the case, that in some ways, you know, that is giving some to the attack on our of having gotten out of control. And I think there's something to that. On the other hand, the court has been doing that gradual, evolving process of limiting the doctrine for many years now. This is nothing new. A lot of the cases Kagan relied on to set out some restrictions, like it can't be unfair surprise. You can't defer to an interpretation that would create unfair surprise. Those have been established cases over the last um, decade. So I'm not sure that she... Um, really pulled back so much as, as codified and made clear the limits on this kind of doctrine. Um, uh, so Gorsuch has a uh, very strong, um, it's a concurrence, but let's face it, it's a dissent. Um, uh, they, the uh, mm -hmm. plurality, uh, uh, Kagan's opinion, ended up remanding back down because it, she didn't think that the court, uh, federal circuit, had done a good job of applying the doctrine. Um, and so Gorsuch concurred in that result. But it's a pretty fiery dissent mm -hmm. to, in going in the form of a concurrence. Um, really attacking the court for, and basically, again, attacking the chief for um, uh, not being willing, not having the guts to um, overturn our deference in this case, and predicting that he thinks the court will ultimately overturn our, uh, this kind of deference. I'm very skeptical. I think this was really the case to do it. Um, and the fact that the main arguments that are raised didn't win the day, I think, means they're unlikely to in the future. I think lower courts will get the message. Um, uh, the big question hanging out from this is, so what about that other kind of deference, deference to agency interpretations of statutes? Um, that goes by the name of Chevron deference. Um, that's really been a subject of conservative ire. Um, and both the chief um, uh, in concurring in Kagan and Kavanaugh, who uh, uh, joined the dissent, they both expressly stated they didn't see this case as resolving the questions uh, having to do with Chevron deference. It's, they see deference to statutory interpretations as different. How different? Unclear. Does that mean different in that it's more likely problematic or different in that it's more likely OK? Mm -hmm. Given that one concurred with the majority and one concurred with the dissent, they may actually disagree among themselves on that question. Um, so that may be something that we'll see um, these kinds of challenges to statutory interpretations. Uh, deference. That said, the court has ducked applying Chevron ever since 2014. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't see any reason why they would suddenly rush to apply it so that they could hold it unconstitutional. So it's not clear to me exactly how that comes before the court either. Yeah, one of the interesting things about conservative evolution on these doctrines to me was Justice Scalia, who was really behind our deference. And then the Obama administration came in and started interpreting regulations, and he discovered it was fundamentally unconstitutional to yeah. do so. Uh, there, you know, there, the one thing I will say is I do think that one of the things that, that triggered some concern, and I think it was legitimate concern, was that there was in some instances a 180 change in how statutes and regulations were read without really, and they're particularly coming out of the Department of Labor, without really giving good explanations um, and really upsetting a lot of reliance. And I think that did get a lot of uh, members of, of the court concerned. Uh, so let's continue with kind of the political theme. Jason Torchinsky, who's a name partner uh, in his own DC firm, uh, also at William & Mary, and has experience as a senior DOJ official talking about gerrymandering. Sure. 
uh, so these cases, there were actually two of them that were decided together. Uh, it was Rucho v. Common Cause and Benesek versus Lamone uh, out of Maryland. So the Rucho case was a challenge to the North Carolina congressional districting, and the Benesek case was a challenge to Maryland's congressional districting. Uh, in the end, that case basically maintained the status quo at the Supreme Court. Um, the partisan gerrymandering claims have a 35-ish year history, um, starting with a case called Bandemir from the mid-'80s. Um, Bandemir resulted in a lot of split opinions. The court said these cases were justiciable, but they couldn't, there was not a majority for any particular test, so they sent this back down to the lower courts. There was a lot of maneuvering in the lower courts. Finally got back up to the Supreme Court again um, the middle of the last decade in a case called Vieth out of Pennsylvania, which was a challenge to Pennsylvania's congressional districts. Uh, and in Vieth, the court split 4-4-1. Four, four, and one. Uh, The four more left-leaning justices uh, split on what the test should be. The four more conservative justices concluded that these political gerrymandering cases were non-justiciable in federal court. And Justice Kennedy said, eh, maybe, but I don't see the, the right test yet. So it was a 4-4-1 four, four, split. Um, here's the problem. The challengers in every one of these partisan gerrymandering cases wind up being proven wrong with the facts. If you look at Bandemir, this is a case challenge brought by Indiana House Democrats saying that the Indiana House map was essentially an insurmountable partisan gerrymander. Supreme Court ultimately did not overturn the map. And the next election, the Indiana Democrats tied the House. And in the next election, the Indiana Democrats took over a majority in the Indiana House under the map they said they could never win under. Uh, the next decade, there was a case in North Carolina where Republicans challenged North Carolina's selection method for intermediate appellate courts. The court actually found for the Republicans in that case and, in the, and said, oh yes, clearly this is an unconstitutional gerrymander. And then the next election before the court could implement any remedy, Republicans won all of the, literally all of the um, uh, intermediate appeals court races in that next election. The Fourth Circuit said, clearly, district court, you gotta go revisit this. Uh, and then you fast forward to Vieth uh, in the middle of the last decade, where again, this was um, Pennsylvania Democrats challenging the congressional districts. Um, they went and said, we could never take a majority of the congressional delegation under this map. Supreme Court ultimately turned down the challenge, and guess what? The next election cycle, Pennsylvania Democrats took a majority of the congressional delegation in Pennsylvania. Um, what this illustrates is that um, Justice O'Connor, who was, is one of the justices who I think best understood the redistricting cases because she was a legislator before she went on the bench, uh, and in fact, in the 70s, when she was an Arizona state senator, had one of her maps denied preclearance by the Justice Department. Um, she really, if you read what she wrote in Bandemir, a lot of what she wrote in Bandemir wound up reflected in uh, Justice Roberts' opinions um, ye from yesterday, and, and he really, he cited to her a number of times. But essentially what she said is, gerrymandering has inherent limitations. And the inherent limitation is, there's a natural mathematical limitation to it, no matter how extreme you claim the gerrymander to be. If you drew all of the districts in a state such that your party won 52% of the vote, all it takes is a slight way for your party to lose everything. Similarly, if you drew the districts so that your, so that your incumbents won 70% of the votes in every one of those districts, you're probably not gonna draw enough districts for your party to control the majority. So there's some natural mathematical limitations in gerrymandering. And the other problem, frankly, that Democrats have with gerrymandering right now or district line drawing right now is that Democrats tend to, in most states around the country, tend to be highly geographically concentrated in small but densely populated urban areas. And this is a problem when you're drawing districts. Academic study after academic study has looked at this problem, and essentially what happens is, as you increase the number of seats in the legislative body you're drawing, spreading out those voters to reflect your statewide voting strength when you're drawing on geographical representation is a lot harder. Just picture Florida. Um, there's a, a study from 2013 that was published where they looked at uh, the 2000 presidential election in Florida, which you know, was evenly divided statewide. But if you look geographically and, and think of Florida as kind of a heat map with the, the red precincts being ones won by George W. Bush and the, and the blue um, ones being the, the districts won by or the precincts won by Al Gore, uh, George W. Bush won 80% or more of the vote in a grand total of 80 precincts around the state. Uh, Al Gore won 80% um, or more of the vote in 800 precincts around the state. So if you think about that, Broward and Miami-Dade basically look like giant Democratic blue skyscrapers. And if you think about it, if you draw a compact district there for, let's say, the Florida House that has, I don't know, let's call it 80,000 people, 
you're going to wind up with a district in Broward or Miami-Dade that is probably 70 or 80 percent Democrat. And so the problem is when you're drawing districts, it's very hard to reflect Democratic voting strength on a statewide basis without taking a geographic area and really carving it up. Um, probably the best illustration of this is what the congressional map of, of the Cook County, Chicago area looks like. Um, Cook County has the ideal population to wholly contain seven congressional districts. It contains all or parts of 11. So basically what Justice Roberts said is there's just no test for the federal courts to apply to decide how much politics is too much politics in redistricting. This doesn't mean these cases are dead. It just shifts the venue in these cases from the, state, from the federal courts to the state courts. And so I think what you're going to see growing out of this is not an end to gerrymandering litigation, but just a change in venue in gerrymandering litigation. And you're going to see it move from the federal courts where it's been for the last 35 years. You're going to see it move to the state courts. Uh, you saw it in Pennsylvania, where in, in full disclosure, I represented the legislative defendants. Uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, Democrats changed control of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court in the 2015 election, and then quite promptly after that brought their lawsuit. Uh, similarly, you see Democrats uh, changing the North Carolina Supreme Court in the November 18 elections and then promptly brought a gerrymandering lawsuit in state court. So I think you're going to see both sides do this, but I think you're going to see lots of shifts in venues to these cases to what is perceived by one side or another as a friendly state Supreme Court venue. Um, so I think that's where we're seeing these, these gerrymandering cases go. Um, what does this mean coming up? It means there may be some challenges to some of these cases in state courts before the 2020 elections. It means the stakes for who wins governor's races and state legislative races in 2020 are immense. Uh, it also means that there will be renewed attention from both sides on the judicial selection process in the states, whether that's nominations or elections or appointments or however the state judiciaries are, are, are constituted, uh, I think there'll be a lot more attention from, uh, there'll be a lot more national attention on state level judicial selection going forward. Yeah. So as, as I, I listen to Jason describe the 1980s and Justice O'Connor's opinion way back in Bandemir, I think to myself how much things have changed and not for the better. Uh, one way in which they've changed is that as a country we are much more polarized than we were on a partisan basis back in the 1980s. Another way in which things have changed is technology. Um, and so to bring to light why I think yesterday's decisions in the partisan gerrymandering cases are such a disaster, let me just ask you to do a thought experiment. Imagine you wake up on election day. You go to the polls, you cast your ballot, you go home and you find out your vote didn't count. Now imagine this doesn't just happen in one election, but two, three, four, five elections throughout the entire decade. Well, you actually don't have to just imagine this because this is the reality in many states in this country after the 2010 round of redistricting and it's gonna get worse after 2020. I live in Ohio. OH. Okay, that's just something we do. Um, yeah, boo. Uh, um, we got 16 congressional districts. As we all know, we're a pretty purple state. 12 of our districts are Republican districts were drawn to be exactly that. Not just to maximize Republican representation, but accounting for anticipated population shifts to ensure that all 12 of those districts remained red throughout the decade. And that's exactly what's happened. All of our congressional districts, the result in every single election since 2002 has been preordained in advance. Now, I suppose in some sense there's a natural stopping point, as Justice O'Connor said way back in the 1980s. Yeah, if they tried to draw all 16 districts Republican, that, that would have been impossible, but it is pretty bad. What the court said in its opinion yesterday is that, oh, this is a political question. The math is just too hard for us. The truth is we've got all these empirical measures that the district courts in Wisconsin, Maryland, um, Ohio, uh, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, uh, 
they were able to apply more or less the same test, looking at the purpose, effect of these plans, as well as the state's justifications for it. It is true there's a natural concentration of Democrats in urban areas and a natural concentration of Republicans in uh, rural areas. But even when you account for these this is sort of these natural boundaries and, and population clusters, you, you draw a random sampling of maps. And when the map that was actually drawn is the most partisan in terms of its bias of any of the 3,001 maps that have been drawn, as Justice Kagan explained in her dissent, well, we can be pretty confident, especially when we've got direct evidence of partisan intent, as we do in these cases. And by the way, it's both Democrats and Republicans who engage in partisan gerrymandering. It just so happens that Republicans, because they did well in the 2010 election, controlled a lot more states and gerrymandered uh, to a much greater extent because they had the power to do so after 2010. Now, you think it's bad now. It's going to get worse. Because up until now, states, if they've been smart, state legislators have at least had to have some pretense that they're doing this for a neutral reason, like we want to promote compactness or keep communities of interest together or something like that. All that's going to go out the window in the next round of redistricting, uh, at least in most states where there hasn't been redistricting reform. Um, because at least as a matter of the federal constitution, there are no limits on partisanship in gerrymandering. Now, there are some states in which state courts can be an effective hedge, but don't count on that too much. Because let's remember, something like 90% of state court judges are elected. In many states, including mine, they're elected on a partisan basis. So maybe you'll have an effective check in a state where the majority on the Supreme Court is of a different party than the legislature and governor, but that's going to be a pretty small number of states overall. There may also be some states in which you can get reform through ballot measures, as actually happened in my state um, and Michigan and a few other states. But as Justice Kagan pointed out in her dissent, it's a minority of states where this is available. And what the research tends to show is that if one of the major parties fights redistricting really hard on a ballot measure, well, they can usually succeed in defeating it because um, if voters are confused, I say this having worked on an initiative campaign before, they vote no, and it's very easy to confuse voters when it comes to redistricting. But the good news here, I think there is a little bit of ray of sunshine behind, behind all this, is because the parties, and especially the Republican Party in the last decade, was so aggressive in gerrymandering and distorting the political processes and effectively denying so many people their votes, there is a lot more consciousness around this issue than there was 10 years ago. I, I'm not optimistic that Congress is going to do anything about this problem anytime soon, as the majority opinion uh, uh, naively or cynically, depending on your perspective, suggests might happen. But I think at some point in the future, we will find a way to, if not stop this problem completely, at least cabinet. So I, I do want to point out one, one thing. The, the Ohio map in particular was a bipartisan deal. Ohio lost two congressional districts, and the political parties basically went to each other and said, all right, you pick which incumbent you want to, to get rid of, and you pick which incumbent you want to get rid of. And they cut a bipartisan deal. And if you look historically in states where they cut a bipartisan deal, you see a lot of stability. It happened in California in the 2000 election. In the 1990s, um, the California maps were drawn by a court, and lots of seats in their state senate, their state house, and their congressional district flipped over the course of the decade. In 2000, um, the California map was a bipartisan compromise. And again, there was, I don't think, I think there was one congressional seat over the 200 and some odd elections in California in the 2000s that changed hands, um, and, and that was it. So uh, just a quick point on Ohio. It's not really true that the plan was a bipartisan compromise. Yes, there were some Democrats in the state legislature who voted for the congressional plan, but it was because they basically had no bargaining power, and at least the plan protected a couple of Democratic incumbents. Woohoo! All right, I want to leave the details <laughs> of IO and ooh uh, to the side for just a minute. I, I will say I do think this case is incredibly significant because, because most of the time when the Supreme Court steps away from something, 
we say, okay, that's okay because the democratic process can fix it. But if the problem is that the democratic process is broken and we can't elect legislators who will do something else because they have selected the voters rather than the other way around, it's really deeply problematic. There, it, we get this, prob this issue where the Supreme Court can't fix it and also it's very difficult for the political system to fix it. And the second reason is that if you know that this is a Republican district and you know that's gonna be a Democratic district, then the, the election is really decided in the primaries and you tend to get the most extreme views on both sides. You just get kind of wildly conservative and wildly liberal people and then they go into a legislature and they can't work together. Uh, and so it, I think it has really, you know, uh, a series of deeply, deeply problematic effects. Um, on that happy note, let's uh, uh, transition to another incredibly important part of the uh, Supreme Court's docket, and that is it has an uh, enormous role in capital punishment in the United States. We have from the uh, Death Penalty Information Center, and Gazi can talk about those cases. We have cases about uh, a real legacy for Justice Kennedy was um, whether and to what extent people who have mental illness and mental incapacity are eligible for the death penalty, and also the recurring concern with methods of execution. Yep. Um, yeah, so I, I always start on a happy note, right, <laughs> talking about the death penalty. Um, and uh, also an Ohioan, so we'll continue representing. That's good. Uh, <laughs> so um, we'll start, yeah, so I think actually starting on some bright notes from um, the, um, the past term would be talking about some of um, uh, one of the court's uh, opinions was Madison versus Alabama and saying that someone who has um, pretty extreme uh, vascular dementia has significant issues with memory, um, capacity to understand, the capacity to process information is not uh, competent to be executed. Um, there was some question, one, if um, the standard that has been set is about whether somebody has a rational understanding of the reason for their execution and, what, and if uh, uh, severe mental illness is impacting um, their, their understanding, when does that actually make somebody um, incompetent to be executed? The Supreme Court um, had seen um, this case in a different posture when it was in habeas, um, uh, coming after um, a habeas petition, and they said, well, in that case where the standard is, you know, there has to be some um, clearly established uh, precedent on this. We don't really have it. We're still flesh fleshing out um, the standard that, that was kind of started with Ford, continues in Panetti um, v. Quarterman, um, and this, uh, case came back again um, where there wasn't uh, relief in the habeas context, but this was uh, an appeal from directly from a state court opinion. And in this context, the Supreme Court was able to say, look, uh, when we say that somebody has to have a rational understanding of the reason that they're being executed, we're not just saying you have to have these specific psychoses that are creating delusions and things that are going to interfere with that rational understanding. We also would include someone like Vernon Madison who has vascular dementia that is creating some serious um, uh, deficits in his ability to understand and comprehend and remember. Um, they said that just not being able to remember the crime is not, would not necessarily be enough to say that it, it makes you incompetent to be executed, but with the, the amount of, um, that his understanding of the reason for his execution is, is compromised, that he uh, wouldn't be um, eligible for execution. So I think that, that uh, the Madison opinion is a place where the Supreme Court has continued to flesh out um, the standards around uh, competency to be executed and, and doing in a, um, you know, a fairly rational way. I would say that there are some other opinions this uh, term where we didn't have as, as uh, helpful gu uh, guidance from the Supreme Court. So let's get to lethal injection. Um, lethal injection <laughs> has been um, a real um, point of, of litigation and a point of much change over the last um, more than 10 years. Um, so there was a major lethal injection, the last major lethal injection 
um, opinion was Glass of Gross before this term, um, 2015. And this term in um, Buckley v. Pre Precite, the um, Supreme Court again uh, was facing this question of what does it mean um, to be cruel and unusual punishment? What is the burden that um, death sentence individuals have when they're challenging a method of ex execution? Um, the background about, around all of this is that uh, currently most, uh, the, the main uh, method of execution in most states is lethal injection. Um, for a while, they, everybody basically did the same thing. Most, most people did the same thing. There was a three drug method. The first drug was supposed to knock you out. The second drug was supposed to paralyze you. The last drug was supposed to kill you. This is kind of just how, how the, um, the very non-scientific method of how people figured out, okay, this is how we can, can uh, create a way to um, humanely, and I'll put that in quotes, uh, kill people, that we're not going to actually torture them to death. Well, um, because of drug availability and other um, issues, the ways that states have been carrying out executions has changed significantly um, over the last 10 years with a lot of different experimental be methods being used. Uh, one of the methods that's being used is a three-drug method that starts with midazolam, which is a sedative, but it does not actually um, there is more and more evidence, even since the last um, Supreme Court decision in Glossip, uh, that midazolam does not effectively keep a person unaware of the intense and excruciating pain that is caused by the last two drugs. And the par paralytic it can mask their writhing in pain or not, and sometimes it does that well, you know, we don't know, we don't have outward indications that somebody is experiencing intense pains, and sometimes it doesn't. We actually see this, that there's somebody who's, um, you know, um, experiencing agony. Um, and if this first drug, this midazolam, is not something that keeps you unaware of the pain that you're experiencing, there's been expert testimony and, and de depositions that really hasn't been, um, uh, effectively challenged that it feels like you are being uh, burnt uh, uh, from within, right? Like it feels like you're, you're on fire and you're being set on fire from uh, internally. So again, like I said, I get to talk about <laughs> the really light stuff here. Um, so, so this is pretty horrible. And as a result of that, a lot of, um, there have been a lot of legal challenges to um, this uh, specifically with midazolam, but to lethal injection in general. Um, so what happened in Buckley was that during oral argument, there was a lot of um, interesting, or a lot of probing questions about, okay, so can we, you know, burn someone at the stake? That's cool, as long as, you know, we don't try to give them extra pain. Um, and there was actually a lot of kind of, um, detailed questioning from Justice Kavanaugh. So when people went to oral argument and saw the questioning from the judges, they thought, oh, this is interesting. Maybe the, the Supreme Court, um, now with the, the additional evidence about the uh, effects or lack of, of, of efficacy of midazolam as its first drug, will have a strong statement um, on lethal injection and, and what needs to be done there. Um, that was not to be. Uh, so we ended up in, in Bucklew with a, a pretty um, um, uh, a, a very split court and a very intense uh, majority opinion from um, Justice Court Gorsuch, which was very clear to say, we are done with this. We don't care unless it looks like the the there's this super addition of pain is this 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 uh, phrase that that he was using. If there's super added pain that's not usual um, for for execution, death is not you know by by nature meant to be painless. You know, so if there's a lot of we really don't care, people. Like you can you know states can kill folks however they want as long as they're not trying to to to, to um, torture them to death. That, that's my uh, short and sweet summary of the majority opinion. Um, but uh, there was an interesting uh, concurrence by Justice Kavanaugh where um, he specifically talked about what the um, 
uh, death sentence individuals have to prove around the availability of alternative methods, and he uh, was specific to say that the, the state might not approve a, a method. It, it's not about what's legislatively approved, it's just what's a reasonable alternative. Um, there were some really uh, strong dissents. Um, I would say that for um, us at Death Penalty Information Center, one of the things that we've been really concerned about as people who try to provide information about the death penalty to the public is these state secrecy laws. And there have been, there's been a proliferation of state secrecy laws uh, around how uh, states are getting the drugs that they use for lethal injection. Um, and when you put together the state secrecy laws and the current um, Supreme Court precedent around how you can challenge a method of execution, how you can challenge um, how the state is planning on executing you and saying that, yes, they're trying, this is gonna be a torturous and painful death. This, the combination of the um, requirements that the Supreme Court has for those challenges and state secrecy laws that say, we don't have to tell you how uh, we are executing people in our state. Um, is a really a real problem that the dissent talked about. So I'll explain a little bit about that and then um, talk about a few more cases. So, so basically, um, the, the Glossop Court talked about how you have to, if, if you're challenging the way that you're being executed, but you're not challenging our right to execute you in some way, then you have to tell us how to execute you. Um, because you're just saying this one way is unconstitutional. Show us a constitutional way to execute. This is kind of, problematic uh, for people <laughs> who probably you know don't want to be executed in the first place but also are saying like hey I mean I don't want to create an execution protocol you know not that I you know have the that that would be better here right that, that do I have the expertise not really um, so one of the things that people have tried to do is say well hey you know this other state seems to find have a, a solution that does not include this midazolam, that does not have the same um, inherent risks uh, that this particular protocol has. However, if this other state is not willing to say much about how they execute people, you really are between a rock and a hard place because even in the situation where you are you know, having to prove like, hey, could you please kill me this way, the way that Texas does? You can't really talk about the way that Texas does in detail because Texas, you know, hides those details, right? Um, so what's the answer? There isn't really, a, so, so Justice Sotomayor is, is kind of the, the champion of saying like, look, every time you say they didn't plead this you know, uh, as specifically as they should, they didn't provide enough detail about whether this alternative was available, therefore we can't say that there is an available alternative, just as Sotomayor is saying, like, so how are they supposed to do this if everything is under this veil of secrecy and they can't actually get the details of how other states are doing, um, are executing people. So that, that uh, came up in the dissent in Bucklew. That actually came up in some more of the issues um, this term but around. But before we switch to another okay. set of uh, capital cases, like I want to make sure that we get Charlotte with some of the commercial stuff, and then hopefully we can come back. Okay. Sure. sure. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so Charlotte Garden uh, from Seattle. There are also an uh, important set of economic-related cases. The court has been doing a lot with arbitration over the past few years. Yes, so there were three arbitration cases this term. Um, one of them divided along familiar 5-4 lines um, with the conservative justices voting to compel individual rather than class arbitration. Uh, the other two arbitration cases, perhaps surprisingly, were unanimous, one in favor of arbitration, one not. Uh, so I'm gonna focus on two of those cases today, uh, Lamps Plus v. Varela and New Prime v. Oliveira. So I'm gonna start with Lamps Plus. Um, Lamps Plus involved an arbitration contract that um, a guy named Frank Varela was required to sign as a condition of being hired to work at a Lamps Plus warehouse. Um, after a major data breach at the company, Varela wanted to fi file a class action under state and federal law. He went to court and did that. Um, and the company moved to compel arbitration. So, so far, this is all a pretty typical story. What happened next, though, was somewhat more unusual. Uh, the district court decided that, well, the contract that Varela had signed did clearly call for arbitration. Um, it was ambiguous about whether or not it contemplated class arbitration. So faced with that ambiguity, the court looked to California law, which like the law of other states, 
uh, requires that ambiguous adhesion contracts be construed against the party who drafted them, um, a principle you may remember from law school known by the handy Latin phrase, contra preferentum. Um, and so the court applies contra preferentum um, and sends Varela to arbitrate his claim against his employer on a class basis. Um, Lamps Plus immediately appeals under the Federal Arbitration Act. So the Supreme Court reverses. Um, its opinion reflects this just continued overriding hostility to aggregated arbitration in two ways. Um, first, uh, there was an appealability question uh, because the Federal Arbitration Act allows interlocutory appeals from orders denying arbitration, uh, but it also specifically bars interlocutory appeals of orders directing arbitration. Now, you may recall from 30 seconds ago that the district court ordered arbitration, right? It just did so on a class basis, um, not LAMPS Plus's preferred method. Uh, the court takes all of one paragraph, there's no statutory analysis to say that an order compelling arbitration on a class basis is equivalent to an order denying arbitration um, because class arbitration is fundamentally different in that it greatly increases risks to defendants. Second, the court goes on to say that uh, the district court couldn't use California's preferred method of contract interpretation to deal with the ambiguous contract that, let me remind you, LAMPS Plus drafted and required Varela to sign. Um, again, right, that's because most defendants want to go to individual arbitration, and the Supreme Court had previously held that uh, judges can't compel class arbitration where the contract is silent. Or, as Chief Justice Roberts put it, arbitration is a matter of consent and not coercion. So I think that consent-coercion dichotomy is interesting, right, when one reflects on the circumstances under which Frank Varela signed this arbitration agreement. Right, both because his choice was to sign or to find another job, um, and because the majority wasn't particularly interested in what Varela thought he had consented to when he signed this arbitration agreement, right? Whether he had achieved a sort of meeting of the minds with Lamps Plus about individual arbitration. What follows is a discussion of the benefits of individual arbitration. When you hear the phrase in, uh, benefits of individual arbitration, you should always mentally add the two words for defendants, um, <laughs> especially in the context of consumers or low-wage workers. Uh, so the main benefit of individual arbitration for defendants um, is that it costs less to litigate on an individual claim than to arbitrate um, a class claim. And I am sure that that is true as far as it goes. Um, but the logic relies on the fact that most employees uh, who are required to individually arbitrate won't actually bring their claims at all. Um, or to put it another way, uh, as Uber and Lyft recently found out when tens of thousands of drivers filed for individual arbitration of their employment claims, it is indeed cheaper to litigate one individual arbitration than one class arbitration. It is definitely not cheaper to litigate hundreds or thousands of individual arbitrations than to litigate a class arbitration. If the court thought that was a realistic possibility, then its sense of the sort of efficient way to resolve claims and therefore what employers would, were likely thinking about when they drafted their arbitration agreements might have come out another way. So what should we make of LAMPS Plus? Um, on one hand, um, arbitration agreements that are ambiguous in this way are probably fairly rare, um, although LAMPS Plus does not give employers much incentive to clarify them. On the other hand, this is twice in two years now that the court has found that a generally applicable legal principle doesn't apply to individual arbitration clauses, right? Last year in Epic Systems, uh, the court rejected the NLRB's rule requiring individual, uh, that individual arbitration in employment contracts violated the National Labor Relations Act. So while the court had left open this sort of narrow window um, for courts to apply generally applicable contract law in its 2011 decision in AT&T v. Concepcion, it's becoming increasingly clear that the court did not really mean that, right? It in particular did not mean that where the application of generally applicable contract law principles um, would result in a conclusion other than individual arbitration. The second case I want to talk about just briefly is New Prime v. Oliveira, um, actually a rare case in which the Supreme Court unanimously declined to order arbitration at all. Um, Oliveira was a long-haul truck driver. He had signed a contract that both declared him to be an independent contractor rather than an employee and, uh, and contained an arbitration clause. Um, so when Oliveira went to court to file a wage and hour claim, New Prime moved to compel arbitration. 
But the important thing to know is that the FAA, the Federal Arbitration Act, also contains an exception. Um, and although the Supreme Court has held that it, uh, the FAA requires courts to enforce arbitration agreements in most employment situations, uh, the statute doesn't apply to contracts of employment of workers engaged in interstate commerce. I should actually say the whole, the whole thing. Contracts of employment of seamen, railroad employees, or other, class, or other class of workers engaged in interstate commerce. So the issue is whether Oliveira, right, who has been designated by uh, his employer as an independent contractor, um, actually had a contract of employment. So to answer that, the court looked at what the phrase contracts of employment meant in 1925 when the FAA was enacted. And even though today the distinction between independent contractors and employees is really salient and people would be very careful and deliberate when using a phrase like contract of employment, it turns out that that was not the case in 1925, that in 1925 people used the phrase contract of employment to mean sort of work under sort of any designation, right, employee or otherwise, um, and that ends up controlling the case. So the significant thing is this approach to interpreting the FAA, right? It's different than what the court did in a 2001 case, um, Circuit City v. Adams, that involved exactly the same language and uh, of uh, exactly the same statutory language, um, in a situation where an employee was arguing that he was a worker engaged in interstate commerce because he worked at Circuit City, right? Huge employer operates across state lines, sells goods that have moved in interstate commerce, and so on. There, the court focused on what engaged in interstate commerce means today, right, or meant in 2001, right? It refused to focus on what the term meant in 1925 when Congress's power under the Commerce Clause um, was sharply constrained by the Supreme Court, right? So I think the court's approach in Oliveira is actually a better one than the court's uh, approach in Circuit City, so I guess there's a little bit of good news. Mm -hmm. um, after Oliveira, the courts are going to have to confront additional questions about who is a worker engaged in interstate commerce. Um, especially this is going to come up in the context of the gig economy. Uh, so are Uber and Lyft drivers engaged in interstate commerce? If not all Uber and Lyft drivers, what about the ones who pick up people at the airport? Mm -hmm. What about ones who you know, drive people home from New, you know, New York to New Jersey? Um, these questions are already being litigated in lots of district courts, right? so expect to hear more about that. Um, the other thing I want to sort of end with is I think the court's arbitration case, case law could continue to get worse for workers and consumers. Um, one of the most important ways that could happen is if the court takes a case about whether workers can be required to waive the rights to bring representative actions as well as class or collective actions. That's important because uh, a list of states are considering creating mechanisms for workers to bring these representative actions to stand in the shoes of like a state labor department um, and sue to enforce their rights. Uh, so far, um, employers have lost their arguments that they can require workers to waive their ability to bring this form of claim. Uh, the Supreme Court has declined to hear those cases, um, but that, of course, may change. All right, tremendous. So in a second, we'll turn to questions and start with reporters. But as we're doing that, and, and you can identify yourself if you want to ask a question, let me just uh, give folks a chance to talk uh, for just a second about DACA, given its significance for next term. And I don't know if Ngozi or anybody wants to get, offer their views on the cases being taken up. No, but let me just finish. Please. The, uh, so uh, there were a lot of save execution um, back and forth, to, and that's something to be watching for the next uh, term. I think we're going to see a lot of, there was some intersection of religious rights, so for folks who are interested in that to point out, um, and there was most recently a Batson uh, reversal based with the very egregious case, but I think that that's something for, to watch in the future. So that's the capital on, the, right. on the capital and criminal justice uh, mm -hmm. sense of some jury and race uh, and jury issues that I think will continue to come up. Uh, I was just gonna say on DACA, um, uh, given the decision in the census case, we were talking about this yeah. earlier, that, that um, suggest that if you give a reason for your actions and then that's not the reason um, that you, it gets remanded. Um, the uh, DACA cases basically have that logic. The government said um, we are rescinding DACA because it's illegal and the court said, well, we actually don't think it's illegal so we're gonna hold it arbitrary and capricious. Um, if the court grants it, it seems like one of the most likely things they might do is say actually that idea that DACA is illegal is right. Right, um, given against the background of the census case, if you're going to grant, um, I think there's a good chance that the Supreme Court may agree with the Trump administration's interpretation of the underlying statute. All right, so questions. <laughs> 
Hold on a second. We'll start with uh, any of the reporters and then can move on. Okay, great. Do we have the microphone? Hi, I'm Celia Wexler. I'm with the online news site Who, What, Why. And um, forgive me for not knowing the name of the case because I thought it would come up because FOIA is so important to reporters, the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, there was a, a decision by the Supreme Court that uh, concerned the grocery manufacturers and their right to uh, keep uh, confidential business information without really having a good reason. And I wondered if you, you all could, or any of you who would like, could comment on the implications of that decision. Um, so this isn't necessarily on the, on the implications. I mean, it's an interesting decision, and um, it continues a trend on the Supreme Court of reading FOIA quite literally, um, and of rejecting lower court elaboration on the terms of FOIA. Um, it's an interpretation of Exemption 4 um, for confidential information. Um, uh, and I, I have to say, I don't think it was surprising um, uh, that the court came out that way once they granted. It's very similar in some sense to the Milner case um, that the court came down with um, a few years ago, again, taking a literalist view of a FOIA exemption um, and as a result overturning long-established lower court precedent. Um, uh, in this case, however, it means that uh, the, the exemptions probably broadened in practice. Um, whereas in the earlier case, it meant the exemption was limited. Um, uh, so there, there's an outstanding question, I think, about um, uh, if you uh, provide information without a promise of confidentiality, um, do, is that going to mean that the exemption doesn't apply? Does, how much does that promise matter for the scope? I don't think the, the opinion resolves that question. And so that's one uh, issue in terms of implications that we have to sort out. Right. In the back. Hi, I'm Andrew Craig from the website Justice Integrity Project. Uh, we hear often uh, in the aftermath of uh, the court's rulings about questions of legitimacy, uh, injustice, and so forth. And my question is, uh, does anyone see of uh, viability or public uh, pressure from interest groups from the House Judiciary Committee or its subcommittees to dig deep into some of these issues with high profile hearings on, for example, uh, the Kavanaugh situation, the witnesses who were not uh, called, but also election type cases. I guess, I mean, I'll say it, legislators, state and federal, have a, a real interest in election law. Um, you know, the, the right and the left come at it from different perspectives. So I think there, there is intense interest in uh, election-related litigation by legislators who are all elected. Um, so I do think there's heightened interest in that from both sides. So I, I, don't, I don't know how that necessarily relates to nominations and confirmations. But I do think elected officials have an interest in how elections are run and managed. And, and you see uh, around the country that I mean, uh, Dan and I see it all the time, there, there's constant change in election law. Yeah. because different states and different legislators are constantly evaluating what just happened to figure out how to fix whatever they perceive as a problem next time. Yeah, one of the interesting things about the field of election law is I think it may be the only field in the country where there are actually more election law professors than mm -hmm. there are election lawyers, right? It's partly because the subjects that we talk about, like gerrymandering, campaign finance, voter ID laws, voter registration, purchase, all that stuff. I mean, people really get the importance of this stuff because it affects everything else, all of the other issues that we've been talking about. It's a relatively small practice area, but it has huge implications. And, and so, you know, I, there's certainly interest in the House on various kinds of election reform, including redistricting form. That was, of course, the very first bill, HR1, in the current congressional term that the Democratic leadership put out, which is an omnibus reform bill. But everybody knew from the beginning that that bill wasn't going anywhere because it had zero Republican support. I would really love to see some bipartisan compromise on election issues, like redistrict, redistricting reform. And, 
you know, for all the problems we've got in Ohio, our state legislature, God love them, actually did come to an agreement on redistricting reform for the next decade. Uh, and it was kind of miraculous that that actually happened, but I, I think there was some motivation for both sides to do so. Both sides were concerned about the tox toxic nature of our politics. There was also some self-interest there, of course, but it was a combination of things. So I, I would really love to see some compromise legislation on gerrymandering or election administration or maybe even campaign finance, but sadly, I, mean, I think as long as Mitch McConnell is the Senate Majority Leader, it's really unlikely that that's going to happen. Other questions? Just a second. There you are. Uh, hi, uh, Elaine Middleman, attorney in private practice. And um, for the law professors, how are you teaching the doctrine of stare decisis? <laughs> <laughs> Uh -huh. Carefully? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I, stare decisis is really interesting in, so for, just take administrative law, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, you have stare decisis being the reason why the chief signed on to keeping the our doctrine of deference, right? Okay. Good argument, long established doctrine, you know. On the other hand, whether or not stare decisis applies to methodology of interpretation is sort of an open question, but still, you know, you can, you can buy it. But then he also signs on to an opinion calling a, the basic fundamental feature of modern government into question in the Gundy case and non-delegation, not blinking an eye at the fact that there's way more reliance. It's super longstanding. Um, so I, I remain unconvinced about whether or not stare decisis is doing more work than being a cover in mm -hmm. certain cases, to be honest. Um, yeah. uh, it is clearly an issue where the justices are engaging on this, and they see this as key. I think Thomas's, uh, was it a dissent or a concurrence? I can't remember. Taking on stare decisis this term um, is, a, is a signal of that. Um, I just don't feel like the cases are giving us a, a principled rethinking of the doctrine that um, wouldn't, if you try to teach it, just make students think, yeah, it's politics. Yeah. I, you know, I think stare decisis is really important, actually, because it does give some stability to our law. Um, and, and I do think that properly applied and given due weight, it um, helps courts and judges avoid the public impression that law, and especially constitutional law, is just politics by another name. Having said that, you know, it's almost hard not to be cynical about the way that justice is on the court. And I, I gotta, you know, it's not just conservatives, liberal and conservative justices alike who deploy stare decisis when it's convenient for them to do so and ignore it when, uh, as in a case like Citizens United several years ago, or, or disregard it or find reasons to avoid it when it serves their own purposes. So I, I think it's un, unfortunate that there's not more weight given to stare decisis than there is, I suppose. Charlotte? And I mean, I, I, so I teach labor law. Um, and so in the run-up to uh, Janus v. AFSCME last, uh, last year and um, Friedrichs v. California Teachers Association two years before that, um, talking with my students about the briefing, I am pretty sure the phrase, if you are arguing stare decisis, you are losing, came out of my mouth. <laughs> um, that said, I agree with everything everybody has just said about its importance. Yeah, I will say that as a Supreme Court litigator or somebody who watches the docket, you know, fully ten. There, the Supreme Court hasn't taken up a substantive abortion case in a while. Of course, uh, you know we had the Texas case, but they have ducked over the course of this term uh, a couple of significant cases, including one from Alabama today. But fully ten percent of the Supreme Court docket is actually about abortion, uh, because particularly on the left, the uh, led by Elena Kagan in this respect, the more liberal justices have really, really decided now. Although I agree definitely with Dan in the past that it was kind of like if you liked the precedent, you would continue to follow it. Now the left has really realized the threat to Roe and a variety of other legacies of the kind of Warren late Burger Court era, um, uh, and and foreseen the prospect that the more conservative majority in the absence of Justice Kennedy is going to be more aggressive about overruling precedent, if not immediately, at least in stages. 
And so the left is deeply, deeply concerned. And we saw this term, Justice Breyer complain bitterly about the overturning of a precedent and say, I wonder what other precedents will come next. And Elena Kagan came along a few weeks later and said, that didn't take long uh, in her incredibly pithy way. Uh, and so there, the, this has taken on enormous structural importance in the law uh, in, the, in terms of how aggressively the Roberts Court will move for the, to the right. And I think it, it does have some tra traction with the Chief Justice. He is concerned about both the reality and the appearance that the court is being incredibly aggressive in moving, whereas some of his colleagues, including Justice Thomas, who said this year he just wouldn't follow stare decisis, as was mentioned, want to really put the, the pedal down and, and move on. And I wonder if we're going to be seeing a lot more of um, the Supreme Court's consciousness of this idea of their the, the kind of public perception of their legitimacy um, coming out in the next year. I know that we've seen we saw that in some of the back and forth around some of the stay of execution litigation where there was a real defensiveness around no, this was not we were not kind of um, just making decisions based on anything. This, there was a principled reason for this. So I, I could see um, in death penalty litigation and generally that where there is this, um, there, there's a sense that they are aware that there are questions about um, big picture legitimacy and how this is the, um, um, how willing they've been to, to start moving away from established precedent. Okay, and with that, our time has run out. Uh, please join me in thanking the panelists, and thank you all for coming. Thank you.